Our planet was created from fragments of the universe. Then life was born. It would grow, expand, and survive, often being sustained by the planet itself. Life kept expanding its frontiers, but most would branch away and fade into extinction. Until finally, one would survive to look out upon the universe and wonder what role it would play in the race for life on the miracle planet. Fifty-five million years ago, dinosaurs had vanished into extinction. The world was left to mammals. It was still a restless Earth. Forces deep within were at work. In 2003, scientists from the University of Oslo discovered strange formations on the bottom of the sea, off the coast of Greenland. They found some 800 holes, almost as if they had been drilled. They were about two and a half miles deep, and they have been dated to 55 million years ago. The continents were still being shunted across the globe. Slowly and steadily, powerful forces were at work under the Earth's crust. The continent of Europe began to break away from what is now Greenland. Deep within the sediment of the seafloor, vast reserves of methane hydrate, a highly flammable gas, lay frozen. When warmed, the gas breaks from its bond with oxygen and gushes to the surface. Exposed to air, methane spontaneously ignites. Flames thousands of feet high blasted into the sky. It's a very efficient greenhouse gas, and the world went into another phase of warming. This period lasted about five million years, and once again the planet was transformed. Here in Oregon in the United States, one of the changes brought on by the warming is plain to see. For Dr. Robert Sussman of Washington University in St. Louis, this is a place of fascination. Embedded here in stone is the first angiosperm, the broad-leafed flowering trees so common on Earth today, the oaks and maples and alders. This is a katsura tree that lived probably 44 million years ago and it's about 25 meters tall and had a wide canopy. What we assume is that once the dinosaurs disappeared, that the angiosperms were, were very low and very small. And then, oh, because of global warming, they came, became larger and larger. And this made an ideal environment for primates to evolve. Our ancestors, the primates, which grew to become monkeys, apes, and humans, still lived in the shelter and safety of trees. The branches of these new flowering trees grow out and across each other as they compete for sunlight. The primates now had new surroundings to live in. Food resources became more plentiful. Many primates still live in the broadleaf forests of the world. They could take advantage of all of the resources, mainly the fruit and the leaves, and also they didn't have to worry about the terrestrial predators find places to sleep and basically live in the trees. It, it developed a whole new environment for them. But living in tall trees does require good eyesight. 
Our primitive ancestor, Carpolestes, lived in the short trees of early forests. As the new broadleaf forests grew, another primate appeared. This one, Shoshonus, had radically different eyes, now facing forward. While the planet stayed warm and humid, the broadleaf forests were able to spread into higher latitudes. As they expanded their range, so too did the early primates. But the expansion was to be short-lived. Forces were still at work to make the climate change yet again, this time from the south. Today, Antarctica is a frozen continent covered by ice and glaciers. When Greenland and Europe were wrenched apart, the result was global warming. When the change came from the south, it was to be cold. Antarctica was part of the large continent Gondwana, joined to South America and Australia. Then, it had a temperate climate. The continent was warmed by currents that flowed down from the equator, much as the Gulf Stream warms parts of the north today. Antarctica became isolated as Gondwana was torn apart. Australia and South America drifted north and the circumpolar current encompassed Antarctica, locking in the frigid air. Antarctica froze, and the world changed. Temperatures which had been kept high because of the methane released from under the sea now plummeted. The broadleaf forests retreated. Primates were left stranded in pockets of forest before they too vanished. This area of the Sahara to the west of Egypt was once forest. Then it became a remnant patch before it turned to desert. Dr. Yusri Atiya of the Egyptian Geological Museum searches for the remains of the primates that once lived here. And they are all around. So far, over 22 different species have been identified from the remnants of their jaws or skulls. One of the early primates that lived here is an ancestor called Catopithecus. When its skull was found in 1992, it stood out as being unique. The eyes are completely different to those of other primates of the same period. When the two skulls are compared, the eye sockets of one have no backing, while those of Catopithecus do. The bone behind the sockets is called the post-orbital septum. While it may seem unimportant, it was a crucial step in the evolution of primate eyesight. This feature is shared by many modern primates. Gibbons have it, so do chimps, and so do we. But how would this be important for primates? To find the answers, you need to study the eyes, something that Dr. Callum Ross of the University of Chicago has been doing for years. He is an expert in primate eyesight, especially the significance of the post-orbital septum. The post-orbital septum evolved because of some unusual changes in the eye, and so when you look inside the eye, you find a clue about why the post-orbital septum might have evolved. This long-tailed macaque found in Asia has a post-orbital septum while the more primitive Galago from Africa does not. The macaque's eye on the right has a circular black spot, 
The galago has not. This is called a fulvia, made up of many small specks, which are the photoreceptor cells. These detected light. The fulvia is a part of the retina, where the photoreceptor cells are concentrated and is critical for sharp vision. A primate without a post-orbital septum has fewer photoreceptor cells, which tend to be widely scattered. Modern primates have far more. The sharpest eyesight is crucial for a tree-dwelling primate. On a computer, Dr. Ross simulates the differences. The image is not as good as this. The image that they see with their eyes is blurry in comparison with what we see. So there's not, they're not as good as, at seeing fine details as we are. Whereas in contrast, an animal with a fovea, and so what you see here is the image around the periphery of the visual field is quite blurred. When we visualize objects, we see the light reflected from them focused onto the retina. The more condensed the photoreceptor cells, the sharper the image. But even with a fovea, if the eyeball is wobbling in the skull, the image will be blurred. The importance of the post-orbital septum is that it holds the eyeballs firmly in place so images are focused even when moving along branches. Vital for a tree-dwelling primate. So when you find a, a post-orbital septum in the fossil record, that suggests that those animals had a fovea, and it suggests they had high visual acuity, perhaps the visual acuity of the degree that you see in living monkeys today. There was another crucial component that eyesight would bring to a primate. As the climate cooled and the forests diminished, our distant ancestors would have needed good eyesight more than ever. Food would be getting harder to find. Competition would be stiffer. Early primates still visualized the world in two colors. have different types of receptors. Each is sensitive to one or more wavelengths of light. More advanced primates develop the ability to see in three colors. The forest turned green, a crucial advantage for finding food. As the forests retreated, fruits became scarce and many primates turned to eating leaves. Trees tried to stop this by adding toxins. Fresh new leaves were there for the taking, so long as you could pick them out. These red leaves are the fresh ones, tender and juicy. Seeing color has its advantages. Then eyesight moved evolution along another step, but in a way which was unexpected. Gorillas, chimps, proboscis monkeys, and others belong to a group called the arthropods. Like us, they have muscles which allow them to make facial expressions. Strangely, this was to push the evolution of primates even further along the path to early humans. With good eyesight, primates, like chimps, can detect slight variations in expressions, something which is important when you start to live in social groups. <laughs> a chimp must be able to recognize other chimps from a distance, and they can do this because they can see in detail.
At the Primate Research Center in Kyoto, Japan, experiments are carried out with chimps to ascertain how many facial expressions they can recognize. This is a greeting expression with rounded lips and the accompanying hoot. This one is happy, as he's just had a tasty snack. And this expression is fear. In the experiment, the chimp sits in front of a monitor where two different facial expressions are shown, along with a related call. When the correct expression is pressed to correspond with the call, a beep tells the chimp he's got it right. They get it right most of the time. With developed eyesight, primates could read emotions and build social bonds. Part of the journey towards becoming human. On the Miracle Planet. If the oceans were the cradle for early life, then Africa is the cradle for humanity. Climate change has had a huge impact on our evolution. As the continent of Gondwana broke up, India began to move north faster than the other land masses. It collided with the Asian continent, forcing up the mountains of the Himalayas. Seven million years ago, they had reached around 5,000 meters, 16,000 feet. This was when hominids began to appear in the fossil records of Africa. In summer, a strong upcurrent of dry, warm air rises into the sky over the Himalayas. The dry air blows down to Africa. From being wet and rainy all year, Africa began to have distinct seasons. The Sahara Desert started to encroach on the forests. As the forests vanished still further, grasslands opened up and early humans were faced with extinction. To survive, they were forced to alter their lifestyle. Two million years ago, there were at least two species of hominid living side by side. That evidence was found in the southern tip of the African continent. Fossils from four million years ago to recent times are buried in layers. This area has been recognized as a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Sometimes it's called the Cradle of Humankind. Dr. Francis Thackeray of the Transvaal Museum is an expert on early human evolution. We have remarkable deposits which are between 1.7 and 1.5 million years old. And in these deposits, we have two species. We have Paranthropus robustus, an ape man, and early Homo, living side by side. It was always thought that there was only one hominid species at this time. To find that there were two came as a shock. And that was a time period of global cooling as well as drying. And eventually the, the tropical forest would have um, contracted and retreated northwards towards the equator. That was a time period when Australopithecus africanus evolved into other forms, potentially. That's one model. And Australopithecus africanus could be considered a distant ancestor, certainly a distant relative of these two forms. The two different hominids, Robustus and early Homo, began to go their different paths. They chose different diets. Robustus seems to have mainly been eating tubers and vegetables, like this one that Dr. Thackeray is digging for. The plant is called Hypoxis. Probably very similar plants were here two million years ago. Good.
it's very clear that Robustus would have been eating plant food such as this, these underground sources of food. There is a lot of, lot of carbohydrate in here and a lot of good nutritious food. In Robustus, in addition to the very large molars, we also have the very large temporalis muscles that went down to the lower jaw. We can say that that was likely to be an adaptation for eating coarse fibrous food. There are other hints to the diet of Robustus. Examination of fossil teeth show many rough patches, perhaps from grit. While the teeth of hominid fossils are smooth. The divergence in diet had a major impact on human evolution. Early Homo chose to eat meat. Dr. Henry Bunn of the University of Wisconsin studies modern hunter-gatherer societies to get a glimpse of the past. Recent bones with cuts from modern hunters when compared to marks made on fossil bone two million years ago are remarkably similar, showing us that both were cutting meat from bone. The other kind of modern, modern study that provides uh, invaluable insight for understanding the patterns that we see at ancient archaeological sites uh, involves a study of modern uh, hunter-gatherers or foragers, as they're called, such as the Hadza. The Hadza society provides a particularly uh, relevant example 